Yes, a little bit about the history of spectroscopy of C60+. So in 1985, uh, Harry Croto, together with uh, Rick Smalley and Bob Curl, in Houston uh, discovered C60 molecule by identified its structure by mass spectrometry and uh, from earlier years I have always had very close contacts with Harry Croto being fellow spectroscopist in fact a number of his uh, uh, PhD students came out to be postdocs and in the pre fullerene days we published papers on some of the wonderful molecules they synthesized first in Sussex, uh, carbon phosphorus triple bond. And uh, we in, here in Basel started to look at the electronic spectra of the ion. So the areas were different. His area was microwave spectroscopy and our area was electronic spectroscopy. With the discovery of C60 here and followed, uh, we started to discuss about spectroscopy of C60 or Harry in particular. And already in 1987, uh, just two years after the discovery of C60, Harry Croto pointed out in one of the early papers that uh, we shouldn't forget C60 plus huh? because after all there's lots of ionizing radiation in the space in the diffuse interstellar medium and uh, it may well be that C60 plus is uh, an important entity huh? in addition to C60. Uh, he actually then wrote a number of further papers with uh, in particular with Mike Ura at the University of uh, California Santa Barbara pointing out that it's not just C60 plus, it's also derivatives of C60 plus, uh, including hydrogen or metals, uh, which uh, are also uh, very relevant uh, entities for problems of interstellar space, in particular the discussion of the diffuse interstellar bands, which has now gone on for over a hundred years, the absorption features towards red and stars. Uh, I had uh, been very well aware of these problems associated with the diffuse interstellar bands and in fact uh, uh, from 1985 onwards let's say we in fact had started quite a large experimental program to um, measure the electronic spectra of some ions and molecules which we and some other people thought were relevant for example carbon chains and their ions. Um, having had these discussions with Harry about C60+, what uh, became evident is that one had to find out what the actual the electronic spectrum, the absorption spectrum for the astronomy, uh, astronomical purposes of C60+, plus looks like. And uh, it just happened that in 1990, huh, we developed uh, a technique, and those, we obtained then the first results, which enabled us to measure the um, electronic spectra huh, of basically any ion you could produce in a mass spectrometer with some constraints, uh, basically mass select it, uh, put it in a rare gas matrix, specifically neon matrix, because it resembles the gas phase uh, much better than any other matrices which were until then in use, such as glass matrices and argon matrices. And with this method, uh, we decided to find out where the C60 plus absorbs. Now, because in 1990, it, Wolfgang Kretschmer, um, just up the road in Heidelberg, uh, synthesized, chemically synthesized and separated, isolated C60. Uh, in the following years, the uh, samples of C60 became readily available. And in fact, if I remember correctly, although I'm not <laughs> quite 100% sure, the first sample of C60 which we obtained for our experiments, which included some C70, came from either Wolfgang Kretschmer or Harry Croto uh, uh, via the group uh, in the States. So with this instrument, we put C60 into the ion source, mass selected C60 plus, uh, and um, put it in a neon matrix at uh, 6 Kelvin, so it's very much like an interstellar space, just slightly perturbed by the neon environment. And then uh, we actually saw the absorptions. Now, um, 
the absorptions were in the near infrared, had two characteristic strong relatively broad bands which we were not sure was due to the solid state effect when one does such experiments in solid state uh, matrices and neon uh, you do get uh, artificial artificial compared to gas phase broadenings due to phonon uh, couplings and side structure so uh, the main point of the exercise was to find the location the wavelength of the electronic transition so we succeeded in doing it there was something like in the around 9500 uh, 9600 angstroms so a rather a difficult region for astronomy because the astronomy measurements are done from telescopes on earth so water absorption features uh, complicate the extraction of the data um, in the paper which we wrote reporting the electronic absorption spectrum of C60 plus in the neon matrix, it, it appeared uh, in 1993. Huh? And uh, actually, there's a paragraph in this paper where we state explicitly that we made a prediction of the expected wavelength range. There will be a slight shift huh? where uh, the absorptions should be looked for in space. And we pointed out that such data were until then not available. Uh, it appears to have been taken up, uh, and indeed, one year later, uh, uh, two astronomers, Foying and Aaron Freund, reported in Nature the detection of two diffuse interstellar bands very close in wavelength to the absorption features which we had observed in the Neon Matrix. And because of this closeness of two bands being relatively close to the experiment, they suggested as first that, that these are the absorption features of uh, C60+. Plus. Uh, following this, um, uh, there were a number of astronomical reports uh, by uh, both by these two astronomers and others confirming the interstellar nature of these two absorptions uh, and uh, invariably in all these uh, papers the concluding remark was well the final proof will have to come from the laboratory measurement of C60 plus in the gas phase and that's where it stood the situation stood since 1994. Now we had of course made these measurements in the neon matrix with the aim of measuring it in the gas phase uh, However, uh, obviously, uh, we were not clever, able, or whatever enough in those days to, be, to do it. And it took us uh, 20 years of uh, experimental development uh, to achieve this, uh, which finally was successful in uh, 2015. Huh? So historically, what we decided to do was that since we knew where the electronic absorptions were, what one had to do it was to develop a sensitive method which would enable us to measure the electronic absorption spectrum of C60 plus in the gas phase under interstellar conditions. Interstellar conditions means that you have to relax the internal degrees of freedom uh, just like in space, so just hand waving in space, C60 plus uh, will collide with a hydrogen atom once a year, huh? but there are many years and you obviously can't do such an experiment in the lab you don't have the patience to <laughs> wait for many years so you have to speed it up and basically the instrumentation and the approach which we developed uses ion traps because one can that one can in radio frequency fields can find thousand to ten thousand of c60 plus ions and this in fact we showed uh, already about 15 years ago huh? that isn't too difficult to do uh, then the complications which arise, you have to uh, get rid of the internal energy. I mean, once you put the ions in such shapes, they are still hot. And you have to get rid of the internal energy and you do this by making uh, the C60 plus undergo collisions with cryogenically cooled helium. Helium which has been cooled to something like 4 Kelvin. And unlike in space, you, you speed it up. So every microsecond you get a collision. Huh? So you're gaining your factor of 10 to the 6 as opposed to space and you work out how many 
how long life in space, how many years. When you do it on the microsecond scale, you have to do it in the lab. So we learned how to do this and we built a special instrument based around mass selection, ion sources, radio frequency traps. And the first such instrument came into operation about 10 years ago with a very able uh, Russian student, a technical whisket who managed to uh, uh, get this going. And initially we were using this instrument to measure the electronic spectra of carbon chains, the ions of carbon chains. Uh, because in those days um, we thought these were uh, the most important things and the easiest things for us to do. So the complication where, uh, which stopped us from looking at C60 initially in those days was that we were using rather special spectroscopic methods to detect the electronic transitions of things like the carbon chains, sort of polycetylene carbon chains, uh, uh, using uh, lasers, uh, several photons from lasers, it's called action spectroscopy, basically it's excitation dissociation spectroscopy. Unfortunately, this method uh, is not generally applicable, particularly for large ions, because what happens with large ions like C60+, plus, once it absorbs the photon, the energy is uh, redistributed in the molecule. So in the case of C60+, plus, it begins to shake and shake, rattle and roll. And in space, this internal energy then uh, is dissipated by emission of an infrared photon. And um, um, in the lab, uh, this process uh, pre precludes the use of the techniques which we're using. So in the next 10 years after we got this instrument, we had to find a way of measuring the electronic spectra of these ions by a different way. And um, what actually happened was about six years ago, I wrote a proposal to develop new methods, new general methods, which would enable us to measure the electronic spectra of large ions such as C60+. This was one of these European advanced grant projects, which fortunately was granted and enabled us actually to develop such methods uh, to measure generally the electronic spectrum of any large ion without relying on this uh, excitation dissociation spectroscopy. So um, the first step in the development of the method was the development of the methods of testing it. And one of the methods, we were, there were actually two approaches which we used, but I shall, I shall concentrate on the approach which was successful for the C60+, plus, is that the initial stage in doing this was that we were trying to measure the rate of complexation of large ions and of C60 plus with helium. So one of the methods which we successfully developed and, and just a couple of years ago showed that this can be generally applicable was, was to take an ion in this ion trap at low temperature and form the complex with a helium atom. And if you then electronically excite the bare ion, the rate of complexation is going to be different in the excited state and therefore by measuring the difference in the rate of complexation between uh, with and without the laser, it enables you to measure the electronic absorption for anything just by differing the rate. So, this, we showed it works, we actually chose a difficult example to demonstrate this. I, by that stage, had a, a very able postdoc who just joined our group, uh, Dr. Ewan Campbell, who uh, came to us from Oxford and uh, it's a whiskey and, um, and uh, fortunately managed to get uh, with the other people, with the other PhD students going. And all this time we were in collaboration with a colleague of mine, Professor Dieter Gerlich, um, who's the, the guru of iron traps. So we profited a lot from learning how to use iron traps. The initial iron traps which we were using were 22 pole traps, which uh, he spent his during his career in particular at the University of Chemnitz, where he was a professor of physics before retirement. And uh, we learned a lot of technology from him and uh, we, it's been a wonderful collaboration which still continues. So we learned how to use the iron trap. Nowadays we actually use four pole traps, but this is just a technical detail. So uh, this method worked. Uh, 
And then we said, right, so now we, this method works, so let's go off and apply it for C60+. Plus. So the first stage in this process was the formation of the C60 plus helium complex. And this, if you have a low temperature, worked uh, uh, pretty rapidly. And our first results were at the beginning of 2.15. Yeah. And then we realized something uh, that probably should have occurred to us before, but it's always the same. <laughs> Maybe statement uh, after the fact is that uh, already in um, 25 years ago, we were using a technique which enabled us to measure the electronic spectra of small ions like N2+, uh, and such, by attaching a helium atom and just knocking off the helium atom. It's called predissociation spectroscopy. The essence of the technique is that one helium atom perturbs very, very minimally the electronic uh, transition uh, of the species and in fact we demonstrated this in 1992 by measuring uh, the spectrum not only of N2 plus but N2 plus with helium huh? and within the laser resolutions which we are using you couldn't tell the difference whether this uh, was the bare uh, N2 plus or the complex ion. So in fact at this stage just earlier this year we realized that actually what the easiest experiment for us to do initially would be just to measure the pre-dissociation spectrum of, of C60 plus helium huh? and this experiment worked like a dream and uh, the most exciting thing of this was that uh, the spectrum of the C60 plus helium uh, the absorptions were superimposable on the two diffuse interstellar bands uh, which were reported. So in other words, we were now in a situation is that there was no longer the shift which we had in the neon and in fact uh, the shifts are you know, not regular but still 5 to 15 wave numbers. These electronic absorptions were bang on where the astronomers made their measurements. So uh, we re Im immediately realized that the perturbation that, uh, by the helium atom was negligible as far as comparison with astronomical measurements and you can actually prove this by putting in two heliums and showing that the shift is much much less than the accuracy of the astronomical measurements furthermore the width of the bands were the same as the astronomical measurements it's basically the internal the width of the bands is determined at these low temperatures primarily not by the rotational structure by by, by the process of this internal conversion whereby the energy you put in is regularly redistributed by the ion C60 plus uh, causing it to heat up huh? and also in space uh, the, the one has comparable uh, width uh, what they call it, uh, full width and half maximum uh, and the relative intensities of the bands uh, were as the astronomers observed so we knew this was absolutely bang on huh? no ambiguity and um, as time went on, and now presently, there are in fact not just two, there are five bands. The, the first five absorption features of C60 plus, uh, which we have measured in the, in the laboratory and, and have been measured in space, uh, agree exactly in wavelength, relative intensities, and with uh, the last three bands, we've uh, gone back to our old standing and very successful collaboration with uh, two wonderful astronomers from Canada who live out in Victoria, um, David Bollinger and Gordon Walker, and uh, by combining our laboratory data with uh, astronomical measurements we could show that there are these other three additional bands. Now. So there's no doubt about it, C60 plus is in the interstellar medium. Huh? And uh, this is the first proof. So there are two aspects to this. The one aspect is that this is the first identification of uh, unambiguous identification now of uh, two to five uh, diffuse interstellar bands. Uh, and fr from my point of view, much more significant. Uh, it proves Harry's uh, Proto's 1987 prediction is correct. And it has very significant implications uh, for the transport of carbon in space. I believe it is there.
and it would be rather nice to feel that in fact we were on the right track. There are some interesting features in space and C60 certainly can fit them better than any other proposal that has been made up to now. I'm a believer and I think ultimately we'll find that it is there. But others have said that uh, C60 is nothing like a match for the diffuse interstellar balance. They're wrong. So again, one can take a little step back in history. In, it was first in five years ago, 2010, that one pro proved huh? uh, there were two groups, uh, in particular the group of Jan Kami, proved that there is C60 in space and C60 also by the observation of emission. Uh, from uh, archived data from the uh, uh, Spitzer telescope, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, from protoplanet Nebula, and this proved, and there are many, many other studies now, that C60 is in a variety of nebula, so the neutral C60, and now comes the proof uh, from our measurements that there is C60 plus in interstellar space, so obviously it's passed from the dying stars where C60 plus somehow is produced and C60 plus is then spewed out into the diffuse stellar medium where again the gravitational forces uh, form the diffuse clouds and in this diffuse clouds it's dominantly C60 plus nuclear radiation goes it's at least a factor of 10 to 100 more abundant than uh, the neutral C60 and of course the final the next stage of this thing is, is the diffuse clouds uh, end up as dense clouds and uh, one of the fascinating questions is of course is are these C60 plus or neutrals if they get neutralized the sources also of carbon chains and so on and this carbon chains in dense clouds micro spectroscopy uh, this was beginning of Harris Croto's uh, ventures uh, the C60, uh, the driving motivation initially was can we produce carbon chains in the laboratory like stars produced. This was this uh, stuff which he did with people like Takeshi Oka, looking at cyano containing uh, carbon chains uh, in dense clouds. And now we're back, uh, 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 back to the future. Uh, 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 to, to see whether in fact uh, the question which has been is that these species have been detected in the dense clouds by micro spectroscopies their formation is uh, very much uh, still questions whether this is bottom uh, top up approach but it may well be that the source of the carbon chains and other molecules in these dense clouds come via C60 respectively C60 plus which is transported and then uh, broken up uh, by uh, cosmic rays and higher energy radiation. So the question is where do we go in the lab after C60 plus? Well where do we go after C60 plus? Uh, well we can again uh, take uh, a lesson from the prediction that Harry has made that yes it's not just C60 plus there's lots of hydrogen out in space so various derivatives with hydrogen should definitely be looked for in spectroscopy here. Perhaps also C60 plus uh, acting as a very efficient sponge with all sorts of elements floating around, uh, whether it's iron, uh, sodium, uh, magnesium and such. So there are great challenges for this to the laboratory and uh, perhaps uh, it will require the next generation of scientists uh, to answer many of these questions. Thank you, John, very much. That was really, really most interesting and very nicely put. Can I just go on a, a little bit about the the, the, uh, the development that you you might see in, in the future? Um, could, could you explain that the, the problem of, of looking for where these electronic spectra might be, and you at the moment have no idea? Yes. So yes, this indeed indeed is a problem, and this is where we had a wonderful advantage over any other groups that we developed initially, as I mentioned 25 years ago, this method which enables us to measure the electronic spectra of mass selected species in neon matrices and uh, this strategy to identify the electronic transition and this method enables you to 
scan the whole visible and near infrared range uh, relatively rapidly now, especially nowadays with modern CCD cameras. And with this philosophy, uh, we've been able to then to go re reasonably rapidly to gas phase measurements. And this is a strategy which we are, well, it's not the only strategy, this is one of the strategies we are uh, still pursuing. So we have two concepts now as for the future. So one is this term, these relevant, what one cons considers relevant molecules, so for example, C60 complex with uh, heavy metals, as the astronomers will say, and C60 with hydrogen ion or positively charged to find the electronic absorptions in the matrices and from that information go and use the ion traps with helium attachment uh, to look in the right region to measure the experiment to measure the electronic absorption spectrum in the gas phase and parallel to this we are having an, a, a sort of an ambitious project whereby one of the ion traps is just going to be doing uh, a blind search uh, uh, with a, uh, in the sense that we produce the species which we are interested in, complex with helium, and then by using uh, easily tuned uh, pulse dilators uh, to scan light region of, uh, of interest to try and find the electronic transition. So there are we going uh, in parallel uh, uh, to prone attack. Uh, uh, so, to make further progress. Are there any other groups in, in the world who are doing the same sorts of thing? Uh, well, I presume they will be. It's always the same thing. Once one has success, everybody jumps on the bandwagon. <laughs> uh, it's not so easy to jump on the bandwagon. First of all, you have to develop this iron trapping technology, which actually nowadays is not that difficult. You know, we uh, that, uh, many people are using such technology so they should be able to uh, uh, start uh, doing such experiments and what people will find difficult where well, we've had you know 20 30 years of experience is having uh, knowledge of where to look for electronic transitions and uh, uh, as just been mentioned looking blindly is a very difficult thing so uh, yes i'm sure there will be other groups currently there are not uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the, one is always uh, ambivalent about this. On, on the one hand, one uh, uh, likes uh, uh, um, to have a monopoly on the area because you know it's, it's really then you, you know you're always the first. Uh, on the other hand, when you reach uh, the, near the end of one's academic career, uh, as, is, as is the case in my case, it's probably very nice. To be able to see in the future that uh, new groups and youngsters will follow follow this up as it's inevitable. It